You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident analyst, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that So I want to make a couple things very clear right here and now. We're going to do two things today, and it's going to make a lot of people mad, but I just want you to know why I'm doing it, and then we're going to follow that up with I don't care what you think about it. Numero uno, we're going to make fun of the 49ers a little bit today. I fully understand that some of this stuff is uh, not exactly fair, not exactly unbiased. Today is not the day to worry about that, okay? We've been doing that all week, trying to be reasonable, rational. Today, we're just having fun. And so I'm going to say they suck. And anybody that reaches out and uses this as proof that I don't know what I'm talking about is getting instantly blocked because I've spent a week talking about the strengths of the 49ers. Number two, after we get done having a little bit of fun, we're going to take a break. After the break, we're going to talk about other football games that are happening today because it's relevant, partially because we're all football fans, and these are football games, and that's interesting, partially because these games impact the Green Bay Packers as well. If you only want to talk about the Packers, and you get mad when I talk about the Bears or the Vikings or any other team, turn it off after the break immediately, like rapidly, because I don't want you to have a seizure in your car. Third thing I'm going to add right now, I don't believe in ghosts. (laughs) I don't know how to transition smoothly into that. But I'm telling you, it just, you know what? The reason I'm freaked out right now is because it never occurred to me that it's ghosts until right now. I swear, every time I'm in here by myself, somebody's walking around in my house. Every single time, no matter where I am, I'm like, dude, somebody's in my house. And I'm like, well, they must be home. But I'm like, I don't hear kids screaming. I hear nothing. There's nothing. I hear somebody walking like, do, 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 like footsteps. Dog is in the kennel. He's not going anywhere, and he doesn't walk like that. It's like click, 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 because it's four feet and nails and stuff. I'm hearing like a do, 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 do. I just heard it again. I just heard it again. And I was less freaked out when I thought it was like a robber, you know, like a bad guy. Because I was like, I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to kick this guy in the face. But also, how many times have you been like, ooh, someone's robbing me, and you go scope it out, there's nobody there? And you're like, ah, I'm just hearing stuff. It just dawned on me, like, maybe you bought a haunted house. The people that owned this house prior to me moved, like, two houses down, which seems weird because they've lived here for two years, and they're like, I'm just going to go scoot down a couple houses. It's like, that's kind of weird, but all right, man, thanks for the house. I appreciate it. It's because the house is on it. Oh, my good Lord. Oh, I'm freaking out right now. I just, oh, I got, you, you, you have no idea the chills right now. I'm freaking out. I want my family to come home. <laughs> I... I just remembered my wife told me that somebody died in our living room upstairs. The chills, I can't explain to you the chills right now. One of you come to my house right now. Somebody come hang out. I made pork chops. I'll make some pork chop tacos. I don't care what you want to do. I know this isn't live, but I might just post it right like it is so that you can come hang out with me. (laughs) Open invitation. What is he doing up there? Why doesn't the dog bark? Bark at the ghost, you stupid, worthless dog. Scare him out of the house. That's all right. It's fine. It's probably fine. You know what else is freaking me out right now? The flies today were incredible. So we've got like a bunch of fields to the side of our house. There's nothing, but there's like, there's like the neighborhood is to the north of us and to the west of us. Um, to the south of us, is just fields and farms and stuff. So there's a decent amount more flies. Plus I was grilling flies. There's always a, a handful. So I, I've been getting pretty proficient with the fly swatter. I bought a bug zapper for outside. That thing is awesome. Today, though, man, I can't even like hardly talk. The chills, like I got chills in my throat. So many flies. Stupid amount of flies. And I'm looking around like, is there a dead body around here somewhere? I'm, I'm telling you, I would go outside. I'd kill 10 flies. I'd go inside, do whatever I got to do. I'd go back to the back door. There's 20 flies on my screen door. 20. I'm like, what the heck is this? It's never been like that before. Have you guys seen, I think it's in The Exorcist, The Flies, right? When there's, or maybe it's Amityville Horror. I don't know. It's one of them. I used to watch millions of horror movies when I was a kid. That's all I would watch. It was good times. But one of those 
I think it was Exorcist. Maybe not the first one, but like one of the later lame ones where all the crosses are all upside down. They all like flipped upside down and then they went upstairs and there's like flies all over the house. It's because there's something in my house, man. And it's pacing in my living room right now. I haven't watched a scary movie in like a month. And the last couple of ones I watched were not that scary. I don't need to watch scary movies. I just got to tell myself ghost stories when I'm by myself in my office, which usually doesn't even freak me out. But it's all the little dots kind of connecting right now that are freaking me out, plus the footsteps upstairs. Oh, anyways, I guess I'm supposed to just talk about the Packers like there's not a freaking ghost pacing in my living room upstairs. How do they do that, by the way? This is always my biggest objection to ghosts is they're not like physical and they don't have weight. So how is he making noise with his feet? The feet that he doesn't even have right now. I don't know, but there must be a way because he's doing it right now upstairs. I wonder what the guy's name is that died. Hey, Frank, stop. Frank seems like a safe bet. All right. um, The heck are we talking about now? Let's start with um, Elton Jenkins is officially out. We can start there. So um, I may have already known that for yesterday's podcast. I don't know. But we didn't really cover was what do we do at tackle now? I think most people are assuming Billy Turner is going to go to left tackle. Dennis Kelly is going to go over to right tackle. That shouldn't... I shouldn't even say that. I was going to say that shouldn't be that big of a deal because you got to remember... As bad as Dennis Dennis Kelly has been, which is upsetting, um, the guy was a quality tackle for Tennessee for a while. So, you know, you look at it from that perspective, but at the same time, again, he's been a backup for a while for a reason, and we also still have Billy Turner at left tackle, which I know we've done that before, but this is a different animal with much better pass rushers, and um, Billy Turner against good pass rushers is, I don't know, I don't even have an analogy, it's just, it just sucks. But at the end of the day, we have we still have two tackles, right? We have a starting tackle in Billy Turner. We sort of have a starting tackle in Dennis Kelly. Uh, and then we got Newman Myers and, uh, and Patrick, I guess. Or Runyon maybe is going to go in there for Patrick. He did a good job. I don't, I don't know what the offensive line is going to be. And I'm sure the Packers are going to hold out to the last second for a shred of hope that maybe it'll throw them off a second. But they don't care. They're going to play who they play, and that's going to be the end of it. You know, when I was a kid, I used to do this. I remember, especially like in second grade, this was a thing me and my buddy Matt used to do. Matt Nelson, on the off chance, he's listening. A little, little shout out to a second grade buddy. That was one of the few years I went to school in Wisconsin. So anyways, he would come over and we would just like visualize scary stuff and freak each other out. And it was scary, dude. Like it, it used to it used to work and it was a lot of fun. It, it was to the point, dude, I can hear it upstairs. It was to the point where you can you can literally see things. Like, you, you would visualize it so much, and you'd freak out so much, and you'd, like, peek around the corner, and you'd see somebody there. You know, it's dark. It's kind of hard to tell, but there, you can see, like, a figure. That's how freaked out I used to be. So I'm, I'm kind of doing that to myself now where I'm getting, like, visuals of things happening. Like, I'm imagining hearing, like, my daughter upstairs. I'm like, oh, they must be home, and then there's nobody there. It's just, like, a, a girl making a noise. Or, like, you know, I went to go close my door. Not really, but, like, in my imagination as I'm talking about Elton Jenkins. I'm visualizing getting up to close the door, and the door just blows open. Stupid stuff, but it's just, it's very vivid. It's fun though. I haven't, uh, I haven't actually been freaked out since I was like, I don't know, seven. <laughs> I used to be scared a lot watching all those scary movies, but you kind of get immune after a while. It's back though. It feels good. It feels great. But I guess at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. We're going up against a head coach that is not even at 500 right now. <laughs> it's, it's not. His uh, win-loss record is a 4-7-0. 31 wins, 35 losses. That's the 49ers. And that's after going 2-0, and playing two garbage teams to start the season. You know, I got to be honest. The Packers beating the 49ers today is going to be great for two reasons, because it's going to destroy two narratives at the exact same time. Number one, the Packers are washed in their garbage and everything else. And number two is that the 49ers are this team destined. And again, the media just can't stop with this team. Their, their love affair with this team is unbelievable. They're destined for the playoffs because they look just like they did in 2019, having barely beaten the Lions and the Eagles. Good Lord. Do you know how the uh, 49ers started their season in 2019? They started 2-0. and They beat the Buccaneers 31-17 to and the Bengals 41-17. to Is that sound like what we're seeing this year, or does it sound like maybe that's something different? 
In fact, the uh, the 49ers did play Detroit in the first two weeks in 2018, and they beat them 30 to 27. That seems a little bit more similar. The 4 and 12 49ers when they beat the Lions. I've never seen a team more. Gu- I I just I wonder has there ever been a head coach that is so loved for doing so little? If we look at win percentage right now, Matt Lafleur is number one. 29 and 9, 763 is his win percentage. Bill Belichick is 726. After that is Andy Reid. After that is Sean McVay. By the way, all of these coaches that I'm reading off are very loved, with the exception of Matt LaFleur, who's hated. He's number one, but he's hated. Um, Kevin Stefanski, technically, but he's had one year. Then you got Mike Tomlin, a very beloved coach. You've got Bruce Arians after that, uh, 0.632, beloved coach. Sean Payton, 630, beloved. Pete Carroll, 630, very loved. John Harbaugh, very, very loved head coach. Then you get Mike Vrabel. Yeah, he's at 593. He's above 500, but not so much. Sean McDermott, very, very loved, 577. Mike Zimmer, respected, 564. Matt Nagy, hated, 558. Uh, Frank Reich is loved, uh, 0.547. Then you got uh, brand new coaches, uh, David Culley, Brandon Staley, and Nick Sirianni are all 500 uh, exactly. Brian Flores is uh, 486 for the failing Miami Dolphins, who have been terrible. Um, and then after that, you get Kyle Shanahan at 464, right just barely ahead of Cliff Kingsbury, uh, Ron Rivera, Vic Fangio. I mean, d- these are not very good teams here, right? He's, he's just below Brian Flores and just above Cliff Kingsbury. But he's talked about as though it's basically Bill Belichick, Andy Reid, and then, you know, probably Kyle Shanahan, then Sean McVay is probably how that should list out. And Matt LaFleur should be down here somewhere around Mike McCarthy, or or probably like Urban Meyer. You know, it was a nice thought, but let's face it, he's trash, right? And it's kind of funny when people talk about injuries. He's been the head coach since 2017. You're telling me that they've had injury issues since day one? So they, they must have had injury issues since day one because they started the season 0-9 when he became the head coach, right? So Matt LaFleur got here 13-3. and Kyle Shanahan gets over here and uh, 0-9. The next year, again, not like injuries toward the end of the year, they started 1-7. 1-7, and the one being the one time they beat the Lions. Well, Jimmy Garoppolo was hurt. It's true, but his record was 1-2 and when he played. So, okay, but we all got to pretend that 2019 is like the be-all, end-all, and that they were the greatest team in football. Not, not that they got to the Super Bowl and got spanked and embarrassed. No, 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 forget that. The Packers can dominate the regular season and get into the playoffs and lose, and they're trash. 49ers once get to the playoffs, make it one game further into the Super Bowl, get embarrassed, and forever Kyle Shanahan is immortalized as the greatest head coach of all time. Okay. 2020, just riddled with injuries, right? Well, they lost week one to the Arizona Cardinals. Was anybody injured in week one? I don't think so. They just lost. So we can play the everybody's injured and that's the reason I keep losing game if we want. But the fact of the matter is, it's not the whole team that's injured. A lot of the guys that we're going up against this week played last year, if not most of last year, all of last year. Trent Williams, their offensive tackle, he was there all year last year. Lakin Tomlinson, left guard, all year. Brunskill, the uh, right guard, he was there. Mike McGlinchey, the only guy that's different is Alex Mack, who they brought over from Atlanta, who's having a terrible year so far this year. But it wasn't due to injury. They just brought a new guy in. The entire offensive line was there. George Kittle did get hurt. Here's two other interesting notes about George Kittle. He played in eight games, and they won three of the eight games that he played in. Kyle Juszczyk, the fullback that they really, really like a lot. Played all year last year. Had a 65 overall grade. Wasn't very good. Guess what? He's still on the team. He has a 51 overall grade. Still not very good. In 2019, he had a 75 overall grade. See, this is this is the other thing to keep in mind. What would happen, let's just say 2018 Chicago Bears defense, right? Chicago Bears in 2018. What if, instead of just everybody being healthy but sucking, let's just say in 2017, 2019, 2020, all the Bears got hurt. And so in 2020, or 2021 right now, everybody's healthy. What would everybody be saying? The Bears are coming back. What's the major flaw in that, though? It's true 
that these guys all played in 2018. It's true that when they played, they were good. They were a playoff team, the whole thing. If they'd have made that double doink field goal, they would have moved on. And who knows how far they would have gone. They possibly could have won the Super Bowl. Probably not, but maybe. Where's the flaw? The flaw is assuming that if everybody had played all those other years, they would have been very, very good. And assuming that right now, all these guys are the same, right? Khalil Mack is going to be the exact same as he was in 2018. Mr. Safety Guy, who is the best safety in football, is going to be the exact same. The problem is we've actually watched it, and we've seen it, and we've seen the general decline. The problem is 2019 Kyle Juszczyk is not 2021 Kyle Juszczyk. 2020 Brandon Ayuk is not 2021 Brandon Ayuk. 2019 Jimmy Garoppolo had a 77 overall grade, and 2020 was a 67. So far this year was a 67, and the fact of the matter is that's pretty consistent with what he's been his entire career. Is it possible like we've seen with a lot of other teams, they had a really good year and they're starting to fade a bit. Like we've seen with the Vikings where they flare up for a year and then guys just don't do as well. Where for one year, everything just kind of comes together. And although they've still got some really good pieces like Bosa and the like, is it possible that maybe not everybody's going to be as dominant as they were two years ago? I mean, really, even if I grant you that some of these guys we know are going to be good, Kittle's good football player, Bose is a good football player. Armstead's a good football player. Fine. Is everybody going to be as good? In 2019, PFF had the San Francisco 49ers as the number one team in football. Number one. Last year, that team was the Packers. Are there differences in one year from the Packers last year and the Packers this year? If not, then we have to say that they're the best team in football. Is it possible that things have changed? Two years ago, it was the Rams. Or three years ago, it was the Rams. Have things changed for the Rams? 2017, it was the Philadelphia Eagles. You know where they were two years later? Let's see, the Eagles, 10th. In two years, they went from 1st to 10th. You know why? Because things changed. Not because their entire team went away. In fact, a lot of that 2017 team is still on the team. They're just not as good as they used to be. 2016, it was the Falcons. Two years later, the Falcons were 10th. Today, the Falcons are trash. 2015, it was the Panthers. Two years later, the Panthers were 19th. Do you get the point? The point is, even if that, that team generally is, is healthy now, why do we assume they're the exact same team? Why do we have any assumption that they haven't declined in any way whatsoever? And look, we, again, we can see it. George Kittle was the highest graded offensive player. He had a 94.4 overall grade. From t- in 2020, it went down to an 85. So far this year, it's a 72. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to continue to decline, but there's no reason to assume he's going to have a 95 overall grade on the season, especially with this much of a start. In 2019, by the way, uh, he had a 93 and an 87 overall grade. So far, he's had an 83 and a 58 against Philadelphia. He never had a 58 in 2019. In fact, his lowest grade was a 69.2. Basically, a 70 was his lowest grade of the entire season. He's already had a worse game than he had the entire 2019 season. You know why? Because George Kittle is a human being and he's 28 years old. He's going to slow down, especially coming off multiple injuries, which is the whole point of this team. The whole point is, well, now they're healthy. They're not 100% healthy. You never come back 100% healthy. They're a year older and they've got injuries. They're beat up. They're banged up. And apparently injury prone. Raheem Mostert. Again, this is so reminiscent of the Chicago Bears in 2018. It was one peak year. In 2018, he had a 70 overall grade. In 2020, he had a 79 overall grade. In 2019, it was an 83. If you look at Raheem Mostert's grades since 2015, 58, 65, 35, 72, 83, 79, and so far this year, a 58, although he hasn't played very much. And yeah, it'll probably get a little bit better, but again, it's an outlier. Joe Staley was the third highest guy. He's gone. Debo Samuel was good. He's still good. Again, Jimmy was the fifth highest. He's nowhere near that high. Kyle Juszczyk, who I've talked about, again, somewhat of an outlier year. Uh, If you go back to 2017 with the San Francisco 49ers, he's been there for five years. By the way, he's 30, almost, he's 30 and a half years old. 70, 70, 75, 65, and so far 51. So he's generally right at about a 70. He had a 75 in 2019. Again, that was his peak. Then last year was a 65 and so far a 52 overall, 51, 52, whatever. Defensively, by the way, it wasn't just Bosa. You know who the highest graded player was on their defense? It was Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman is not playing there anymore. He's a free agent right now. 90.3 overall grade, Richard Sherman. He's gone. Richard Sherman had 
Uh, 34 receptions for 373 yards, gave up one touchdown, had five interceptions and six pass breakups. He was, I think, the best corner in all of football, or at least one of them. They don't have good corners. Again, Nick Bosa, fantastic football player. Um, as a rookie in 2019, he had a um, basically a 90 overall grade, 89. The next year, it went down to an 85. So far this year, it's a 77. Again, he was hurt last year, and he's only played a couple snaps so far this year. But who's, what, why do we have to assume he's going to get back to his original form? He's still very, I'm, I'm conceding he's good. Why do we have to assume he's going to get back to his original form? 102 pressures on the season, which is a crazy number. Eric Armstead, again, very good football player. He had an, a, a 90 overall grade that season. After that in 2020, it went down to a 76, so far an 81. Again, 2019 was the outlier. Here's his grades his entire career. 79, 53, 70, 74, 90, 76, 81. It's a massive outlier. This is, what I, this is exactly what I said about the Bears all those years. All these guys did really well, but they're outliers. And what happened to the Bears? A lot of these guys left. Fangio left. By the way, their defensive coordinator, the, their Fangio, he's gone now. He's now the head coach of the Jets. But beyond that, Richard Sherman is gone. A lot of these other guys are gone. Uh, Eric Armstead was, uh, let's see, he would have been, he's turning 28, so he would have been 26. There's a difference between those two things. Still a good football player, but again, no reason to believe he's going to be exactly as good as he was in 2019, because 2019 was a crazy freakish outlier of a year. You want to talk about a massive outlier, Jimmy Ward, these safeties. Jimmy Ward is barely average. Let me read off his grades. By the way, he's 30 years old. Again, he's getting up in age. I'm not even going to read off what the year is. You tell me if you can pick the year out. Ready? 48, 71, 66, 54, 55, 85, 73, 69. Kind of a giveaway because, you know, you can count back three years. But 85, very obviously an outlier year. They also had DeForest Buckner on the team. He was the next highest graded guy on their entire team. He's gone. He's with the Colts right now. K1 Williams, let's do it again. Ready? Uh, since being with San Francisco in 2017, here's his grade, 75, 66, 80, 66, 56. Anybody notice anything weird about 28, 2019? Is an outlier. He's not that good. It was a, it's one of those situations where you have a perfect storm, where you have this perfect system with a perfect team, and you got all these guys, and it finally melds together right? You've got the system, but then you've also got everybody kind of clicks at once. It's, it's like the 2020 Packers offense. Everything just kind of clicks, and you've got all the pieces. You've got the offensive line, the quarterback, the wide receiver, the running back. All the little independent pieces have come together to form this great offense. That was the 49ers defense. A lot of these guys are gone. A lot of these guys are old. By the way, the defensive coordinator is gone. Next highest graded player, Ronald Blair. First of all, he's gone. He hasn't played since 2019, and I think he's a Jet right now. I don't know. But um, here's his grades, 55, 62, 61, 77, <laughs> and then out of the league. It was such a freakish, flukish thing that even this nobody of a football player played as a rotational guy and dominated. They still have players. They still have good players. But to sit here and say that the 2019 49ers have just been sitting dormant waiting to come back to full strength and fully healthy so that they can come back and just dominate the way they did in 2019 is a fantasy. The 2019 team is gone, just like the 2019 Packers are gone, and the 2019 Rams, and the 2019 Steelers, and the 2019 Bears. These are entirely different teams now, and the 49ers are no different. We're in the process of trying to figure out what the 2021 49ers are, just like we're trying to figure out what the 2021 Packers are. The fact that we can look at this game, this is how stupid we are. We look at the 2021 Packers and we say, this team doesn't seem to be very good. Why? Why do you think that? Why don't we look at 2020 and say, that's how good they are? Well, because they don't seem to be as good. Oh, so something changed? Again, we've seen the 49ers barely beat two really bad teams, and we just assume that because they're 2-0 that they're the 2019 version of their team, even though it's an entirely different team, that we just know they're going to be that good. What sense does that make? Almost nobody on this team, almost nobody, is playing as well as they did in 2019 right now. Nobody is. In fact, I didn't find anybody that was playing as well, and that doesn't even include the guys who are not even on the team anymore. 
So the 49ers, unfortunately for them, have to go through the same thing that all of us have to go through. There's a period of discovery where we have to figure out what is your team in this year. And I'm sorry, we can't just gift you. You are the 2019 version. This whole fantasy where this team has just been lying dormant, it's the exact same team. It's essentially they were put into this time capsule. They were frozen like in the movies, you know, where you freeze a guy and then a thousand years later you thaw him and they come back and everything's just the way it was. That's what we think happened with the 49ers. That ain't how it works. Everybody has aged. Everybody's been injured. Half the team is gone. The defensive coordinator is gone. Everything has changed. And now you have a head coach who has accomplished absolutely nothing in his career except making it to the Super Bowl once, who has to prove that he can put together his second winning season in his, what, fifth, sixth year now? He's trying to get his second winning season? I'm sorry, I'm not just going to gift you. You guys are definitely going to the Super Bowl. I'm not going to gift you that. You have to earn that, just like everybody else has to earn that. And your next test is the Green Bay Packers. That's the next step. And that's all it is. It's a next step, next step toward discovery for them to discover who they are, for us to discover who they are, to, to, to fill in one more little blank. But win, lose, or draw, all these problems are still problems. And from what we've seen so far, I don't see the 2019 49ers. I see a team that if they go up against an actual quality opponent, they're going to get smashed. 17 to 11? Are you freaking kidding me? I mean, I don't know. Maybe the Eagles have an elite defense. I I don't know, but um, that's not impressive. And for all the Packer fans who want to hate on the Green Bay Packers, tell me how you would have reacted if we beat the Philadelphia Eagles 17 to 11. Would you be impressed by that or would you be saying that this team is not good enough? Because I have a feeling I know exactly what the answer is. You'd be saying this team isn't good enough. And you know what? There's some truth to that. There there is a quality of winning situation, but the point is you got to look at the 49ers the same way. Same with, again, we, we have one common opponent. It's the Detroit Lions. Which do you think is the better win? 33 to 41 or 17 to 35? Which one's a more decisive win? Well, it's the one that didn't allow a massive comeback and almost lose the game. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing I'm seeing. So, anywho... Felt good to take a couple shots at this team because at the end of the day, regardless of what happens, I hate the 49ers with a passion, with an absolute passion. I have not, I still have not gotten over the, uh, I mean, forget the last time we played them back in the Kaepernick days. I have not gotten over that. I hate this team. It wouldn't be a stretch to say I hate the 49ers more than the Bears. Those NFC West teams, man, I tell you what, I can't stand them. The the Cardinals, uh, the 49ers, the Seahawks. But the 49ers take the cake. They're just, they're the absolute worst. The absolute worst, and I can't stand them. But anyways, we might as well go ahead and take a break. Uh, If you'd like to support the podcast, please do so. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. Um, The giveaway for the Devontae Adams signed jersey. I think we'll probably do that tomorrow because I want to be able to uh, announce that on the live stream and whatnot. Um, But if you head over to Twitter, check out pack underscore daddy. It is my pinned tweet. We've got 50 people that have retweeted it so far, so there are 50 people entered. But again, all you got to do is sign up at pristineauction.com. Use promo code Packernet. If you haven't, if you've already signed up, you don't use promo code, I'll get over it. But I would like it if you could so that they know that we sent you over there. Because they're planning on, um, depending on how this goes, my understanding is they're planning on doing more giveaways, which means more opportunities for you to get free stuff, which is great. But otherwise, um, retweet and follow me on Twitter and uh, you're entered. That's it. Good to go. But we'll take a break, and we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. 
And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Anyways, looking at a couple other team uh, games here, we got the Washington football team and the Buffalo Bills. What t- what name do we come up with for Washington? I know there were a bunch, but there was one that I liked. I think it was the Washington Whatchamacallits that I liked the most because it just kind of rolls off the tongue. But I don't know. Ultimately, I think I just want Buffalo to lose, even though I tend to say Buffalo is my second favorite team. But the less super dominant teams there are, the more likely the Packers are to win a Super Bowl. That's just the bottom line. And there have been years where there's some teams that are just untouchable. Does not seem like, at least so far, the Bills are one of those teams. But with that said, they are seven-point favorites, and for good reason. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick has been put on IR, which is uh, pretty devastating. But you got Mr. Heineke, so, you know, that's a thing. But I don't know. I don't, I don't, um, I don't think it's necessarily a guarantee. I've never really bought into the Buffalo Bills wholesale. I mean, the connection between Diggs and Allen is incredible, and it's it's pretty impressive. But this has got to be one of the worst offensive lines in football. Um, they've been terrible. And despite the lack of production from the defensive line, they're still a very, very good defensive line with Sweat and Allen and Payne. Um, and, and Chase Young, obviously, who, again, not off to the best start in the world, but super talented. They're just going to wreak havoc. They're just going to absolutely wreak havoc. And so the, the bigger issue is going to be the DBs. But still, I mean, it, it makes it so that it's at least not a guarantee. Am I picking Buffalo to win? Yeah. Would I put money on it? Absolutely not. And again, it's very similar to the whole Packers situation where, yeah, if you look at the roster, I mean, the, the Buffalo Bills defense is better than the uh, Washington offense. And they don't have the DBs, so, you know, whatever. But it's just one of those things where you could see it spiral out of control. If they can't control this defensive line, um, that could be all it takes. And then you get a little bit of a rhythm on offense, um, kind of moving against these DBs who are, you know, again, Tredavious has just been going down. I mean, he had a good rookie year. Other than that, he's done very little. Um, one of the more overrated guys in football. I, I like him, but it just hasn't been there. So far, he's ranked 64th out of 100 corners. Wallace, the other, is 74th out of 100. So they don't have the DBs either, necessarily. Um, got a couple guys along the defensive line. Milano's doing a good job at linebacker. You still got Hyde um, at safety. But I don't know. I just I just wouldn't touch it. I'm, I'm kind of halfway rooting for Washington, although don't, I don't care. And I just I wouldn't touch it with any of my money. Uh, the next game that obviously matters to us, Chicago and Cleveland. Big game because of Justin Fields. We get our first official look at him to see what he can do. Um, It's not anything super definitive, but he has not been super impressive up to this point. But again, he's been given the full week to prepare for Justin Fields, not for him to come in as a backup. I mean, the whole game plan, everything is built around Justin Fields, so we'll see how it goes. Um, Cleveland, though, still 7.5 point favorites, uh, according to the market in general. PFF has him at minus 8. Um, Dalton is out. Atachu is hurt. Hicks is questionable. Goodwin is questionable. Mooney is questionable. Eddie Jackson is questionable. Uh, Bilal Nichols is questionable. So they've got a, a bunch of guys banged up. Um, on the other side, Jarvis Landry's on IR. Walker's on IR. Taki Taki's out. Uh, Hubbard is out. And then uh, Willis and Treader are questionable for this game. But ultimately, I just don't really see a clear path for the Bears to win. I mean, I, listen, the, the 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 thing that scares me, and it's the reason I wouldn't bet on them either, and I would never really want to bet on the Browns, is because I just don't trust them. They're way too volatile. But they still have a dominant offensive line. Baker Mayfield is still a competent quarterback, although he's terrifying because you never know what version you're going to get. Uh, Odell Beckham is playing. Hooper is still a good tight end. They have a big, real good group of running backs. This Bears defense... There's just nothing here. Uh, Roquan is off to a good start this year. He's graded as the seventh highest. Um, Jalen Johnson, second round pick, is off to a fantastic start so far this year. 
But the defensive line, as you know, is terrible. Khalil Mack again off to a bad start. 56th he's ranked out of 105 edge rushers. Um, Akeem Hicks, 69 overall grade, 26th out of 117, which isn't terrible, but it's certainly not dominant. Nobody, I mean, the only guys who are graded 70 or higher are, again, second-round uh, cornerback Jalen Johnson and Roquan Smith at 80.3. Everybody else is 60s um, or 40s, Ogletree and Vildor, the other corner. So I just don't know what you do. I mean, even if they just run the ball, their defensive line isn't really much of a match. And, and again, I think Odell Beckham and Schwartz and Donovan Peoples-Jones is just going to kind of tear them up. And on the opposite side, you have legitimately one of the worst offensive lines, with the exception of Peters at left tackle, going up against Miles Garrett. Um, Malik McDowell is just an absolute terror. I mean, Malik McDowell, McDowell is a crazy story. This guy was very highly touted. He fell to the second round. He ended up getting in like some ATV accident or something. I didn't even know he was back in the NFL. I really liked Malik McDowell a lot because although he was not super refined, he was just an absolute freakish wrecking ball. I didn't know he was back. I just remember seeing his name and being like, dude, Malik McDowell. But uh, he's he's back and he's doing really well. He's the 10th highest graded defensive tackle in football right now. They also have Jadavian Clowney off the edge, who's not doing well as you could expect. Malik Jackson. It's a, it's a good defensive lineup against a terrible offensive line. And again, Justin Fields, who so far has a 54 overall grade, which is what he did in the preseason as well, is going to have to play behind this terrible offensive line. Cole Komet, 59 overall grade. Allen Robinson is ranked 81st out of 103 wide receivers, having a terrible, terrible start to the season. Mooney, who is like the one shining spot of this whole thing, again, is is injured. I don't know if he's going to play, probably, but even if he does, it's a little bit uh, concerning. So I just, I don't really see much of a path. There's always a path. There's always a way, but the Browns are a better team is the bottom line. And it's in Cleveland. It's just, I don't know. Uh, Baltimore and Detroit is an absolute joke. Somehow Baltimore's only a seven and a half point favorite. Um, I might have to put I might have to put something down on that. Seven and a half. I mean, that's just crazy. I, I don't usually like. I have a hard time putting money down on anything over you know like five points or something because things are just so volatile. You know, I, I like picking winners and losers. Seven, You never know. I mean, the Ravens could win, but the Lions could pull it close. But I'm tempted on this one because, dude, Ravens-Lions just feels like it's going to be a slaughter. I know Lamar had a thing. said something about his hip got hurt when he did the flip, but then later it came out he was out because he was sick. It was an illness, but sounds like he's fine. I guess the concern is the, uh, the Ravens' defense. Um, they've got like the worst linebackers in football right now with Malik Harris and Patrick Queen, who's, again, horrible. Um, they're not getting any production off the edge. The only guy that's really doing anything is 35-year-old Calais Campbell, who just can't be stopped. Um, they do have Humphrey at corner, who's fairly solid, but I don't know. Maybe I just won't touch it because that's a little bit scary, and I could see the Lions at least trying to keep pace. I mean, they, if they could do it with the 49ers, they can do it with the Ravens. But, I mean, this one's pretty straightforward to me. I, I think the Ravens are just going to spank the Lions. Uh, Indian Tennessee really doesn't matter to me at all. Tennessee's minus six. Um, as far as my thoughts on it generally, the uh, Tennessee Titans have not really gotten off to a great start, and a lot of it has to do with this offensive line. Uh, Taylor Lewan is a top-end offensive tackle, but he's just doing terribly so far this year after coming off of, I don't know if it was injury or what happened to him last year. He didn't play very much, if at all. But it's not just that. Saffold, Jones, and Davis are all also getting off to terrible starts. And when your entire team is predicated on this really good offensive line where Tannehill can operate behind it and Henry can dominate behind it, even though those two are grading out, they're both third in their respective positions. But that's that's where this whole thing starts. And with no offensive line, that makes it very, very difficult. On top of that, none of these wide receivers are producing at all. A.J. Brown uh, was the second highest graded wide receiver in football last year. He's 73rd right now. But it's it's kind of similar to the Packers where you look at it and go, they're going to pick it up. I mean, they have to. So, again, I'll, I'll, I'll take Tennessee to beat the Colts, but I, I don't know and I really don't care, and I'm certainly not taking a minus six. Kansas City Chiefs and the L.A. Chargers, no way in the world am I taking the Kansas City Chiefs to minus seven. Um, I'll concede that they'll probably win, and it may be kind of big, um, but I just I can't do it. The Chargers are just one of those teams. Chargers and Raiders I'm not touching when it comes to the Chiefs. They're just really weird teams that play the Chiefs really well every single year, and I just, I don't like it. For example, last year, the Chargers beat the Chiefs 38-21, to 
The year before that, the Chiefs did win, but they won in overtime by three. So uh, minus seven, I don't think so. In 2019, they did beat them by 10, um, but it's just, I I just, I can't do it. And again, I think the Chiefs, even though they're still a good team, I just see them too much like the Seahawks. There's just going to be a slow bleed, very, very slow and gradual decline. Um, That decline continues and continues. I don't think they've done anything to help support this team. Uh, The offensive line has been subpar. The wide receivers outside of Tyreek, who's now outside of being a top 10 wide receiver at this point, um, are abysmal. Hardman and Robinson are a joke. Uh, So it's Pat Mahomes, who's ranked 19th right now at quarterback, by the way. Uh, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire is ranked 56 out of 56 running backs. The fact that he was so hyped last year was always a joke. So you've got number 19 Pat Mahomes throwing to number one Travis Kelsey and number 12 Tyreek Hill with a mediocre offensive line, no other wide receivers, and a terrible running back. Now, the Chargers don't have a very good offense or defense, but what they do have is Nick Bosa and a couple good corners. On the flip side, again, the Chiefs' defense is a, it's just it's just a joke. I don't know what else to say. And Herbert is 12th, so one spot ahead of uh, where Pat Mahomes is right now. Eckler is 11th, so they've got that at running back. you got Williams and Allen, who are both good wide receivers. Uh, at least half the offensive line is pretty solid. They're improving that. Going up against what? Chris Jones is like the only thing on this defense that's worth anything. The defensive line outside of Jones is ranked 112th out of 117, 92nd out of 117, and 101st out of 105. That's the rest of their defensive line, the worst basically of anybody. Linebackers, 54 out of 75 and 70th out of 55. Sorensen is the second worst safety in football. Charvarius Ward, the corner, is 88th out of 100. Tyron Matthew, 54th out of 78. So again, I'll concede the Chiefs probably find a way to win this game, but I'm in no way in the world am I taking them at minus 7, and I wouldn't even be surprised if they lose the game. If you want to, you can. I don't care. I'm just telling you this is a weird game. Saints-Patriots, the uh, Patriots are minus three. PFF has them at minus two and a ha- uh, 2.2. I'm, I'm not touching this one either because I don't know what either of these teams are. The Saints blew out the Packers and then got blown out the next week. The Patriots, I have no idea what they are either at one and one. Uh, so you got two teams that are kind of trying to figure out where they are um, who are just kind of floundering. The only reason I would lean Patriots is because the Saints are, are a team that has some talent but are also very flawed. And I think Bill Belichick is what I kind of wish uh, Matt LaFleur was a little bit more of. And, and maybe he'll get there. I don't know. But, you know, he's the he is the ultimate coach when it comes to exploiting your weaknesses and taking away your strengths. So whatever the strengths are of the Saints, they're going to be taken away. Whatever the weaknesses are, they're going to be exploited. And again, the Saints have a ton of weaknesses. So I would lean Patriots, but I'm again, I'm, I'm terrified of that. Also, it's in Foxborough, so yeah. I'm relatively comfortable at the Patriots, but you never know. They, they've got so many weaknesses themselves. Who knows? If the Saints start tearing it up, anything can happen. But I'm I'm leaning. I'm more comfortable with the Patriots than I am the Chiefs. Let's put it that way. Giants, Falcons. I, pff, I, I got to lean Giants, but I don't know. And I guess I don't really care. They're, they're both so bad. Um, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. Again, I don't really care, but it uh, would be nice to see Cincinnati put up a fight against Pittsburgh. Um, just because we have to play Pittsburgh and I want to see them play very, very poorly. Also, TJ Watt is out. Um, There's quite a few players out, actually. Highsmith, uh, Johnson, um, Davis, C. Davis, whoever that is. But TJ Watt being out is obviously pretty massive. Um, And then when you factor in the fact that the Steelers' offense is not very good, um, Steelers defense has been reduced. I mean, I don't know what's going on with Minka Fitzpatrick. He's ranked 78th out of 78 safeties right now. He is literally the lowest graded safety in football. I'm sure he'll pick it up. Again, there's a lot of these outlier type things. Um, but that's, I mean, he has a 29 overall grade. That's about as bad as it gets. He's given up 108 yards in just two games. That's kind of crazy. But the point is, uh, without TJ Watt, it changes the whole dynamic. They still have Cam Hayward, who is just the absolute freakiest of freaks. He's the number one rated defensive tackle in football. And they got a couple other guys that are still talented with Ingram and Wormley and whatnot that are good enough. But they don't have elite corners. They don't have elite linebackers. And they certainly don't have elite safeties right now. It's enough for the the Bengals to kind of work with. And again, on offense, there's just nothing to work with here. I mean, it's the best player on this entire offense is Chase Claypool. 
and that's kind of pathetic. So again, I don't really care, but it's just if if Pittsburgh was heavily favored, I would probably put some money on Cincinnati, but it's Pittsburgh minus two and a half, which really just goes to show you how how ridiculous this whole thing is. Um, I think it's partly because the Bengals are a little bit better than people thought, and also Pittsburgh is just worse than people were expecting. So Pittsburgh's still favored, but not by much. But I kind of wish that it was a little bit hotter. You know, if they had like Pittsburgh minus five or minus six or seven or whatever, I'd probably pick Cincinnati with the points. Arizona and Jacksonville, Arizona minus eight. Um, I don't see any reason to to really touch that again. Minus eight is too scary. For, it says minus eight. This says minus seven and a half, whatever. Still too scary to play with that, but there's no reason. I mean, if you wanted to go for it, um, Arizona is just white hot right now. And even if Arizona is a little bit fluky and a little bit fake, the Jaguars are not the team that's going to expose them. So I think Kyler Murray is going to continue to play at a really, really high level. And, um, I just don't think the Jaguars are going to be able to do anything to stop it. The, again, the defense for the Cardinals isn't great. Somebody's going to step up to this team and just spank them, but it's not going to be the the uh, it's not going to be the Jaguars. In fact, next week I don't know who they're playing next, but the week after they end up spanking the Jaguars, if there's a tough team coming up, that would be a good time to to look at that team because this will be you know the three and O Cardinals who have just absolutely annihilated some teams, even though we ignore the fact that it's the Jaguars. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to overwrite the Cardinals, I guess is what I'm saying. But yeah, Kyler Murray right now is the fifth highest graded quarterback. He's just playing out of his mind, obviously, because I just got done talking before the season started how he's overrated and he's just tearing. Saw some of his highlights. They're incredible. By the way, Christian Kirk, absolutely exploding right now. He was a, uh, considered one of the greatest wide receiver talents. Obviously, there's always a guy like that and he ended up falling to the second round, but He's underperformed even for a second-round pick. He's now the second-highest-graded wide receiver. They've got DeAndre Hopkins, who's just obviously a freak because he's always a freak. Um, They brought in Max Williams from Baltimore, who's a fantastic tight end. He's rated eighth right now. The offensive line still isn't very good. The running back still isn't very good, but it's more than enough to operate with, again, against the Jaguars. Again, if you want to take the minus 7.5 or minus 8, go ahead. I don't like doing that because the NFL is just too fluky for me to say that somebody's going to win by that much, but... Um, I wouldn't be mad at you if you did it. Denver and the Jets just makes me angry because Denver right now is 10 and a half point favorites. I'm tempted to take the Jets just because that's a stupid line to put on a team like the Broncos. I just, I don't know how you give 10 and a half points to this team. I, I, maybe I'm just not paying close enough attention, but that's, that's too high. They don't have enough talent to, to put that much faith in them. I mean, if you wanted to do the, even the Chiefs, where they're missing people, but they got Pat Mahomes or whatever. Okay, I kind of get it, but you're putting that on Teddy Bridgewater and Cortland Sutton? I mean, I get the Jets have not looked very good. They don't really have a quarterback, apparently. The running back isn't good. The wide receivers haven't been very good, but I I don't know. It's just that's too much for me. So the, the, are the Broncos going to win? Yeah, I'm sure they're going to win. Ten and a half, no chance in the world. I would be tempted to put money on the Jets for that one. Uh, Miami Dolphins and the Raiders. Um the interesting thing with this, I would be tempted to take the Raiders because the Raiders are minus three and a half. Um, and then Tua went out. They actually put him on IR, but I'm almost wondering if they have a better shot with Jacoby Brissett. Not that I'm a huge Jacoby Brissett fan, but Tua has been so bad. And Miami is, you know, there was a lot of hype about Miami, and it seems like Tua was just kind of holding him back. You kind of wonder, you know, when, for example, in that Notre Dame game, uh, for those of you that unfortunately had to watch that, when uh, Cone went out, they brought in another quarterback, and he just kind of tore it up. Now, that's college. It's not the pros. But Brissett is is competent enough where he could possibly come in and distribute the ball, and they have some weapons. Waddle is a good wide receiver. Fuller is a good wide receiver if he's even playing. Parker is a decent enough wide receiver. I mean, we're talking like you know, low-end number one, high-end number two type wide receivers, but they've got three of them. Miles Gaskin is not terrible. Gasicki is not the worst. This offensive line is horrible. But there's enough guys here to distribute the ball around. Beyond that, the Raiders are massively overrated right now. They have a terrible defense, but their defense has been off to a white-hot start. They have the number one corner in football right now, Casey Hayward. Now, I don't mean to talk down to Casey because Casey's obviously a very good player, but I don't think he ends the season number one. Beyond that, Max Crosby, who was the 81st ranked edge rusher last year and the 61st the year before that is now the number one edge rusher in football after two weeks. Yannick Ngakwe is the seventh highest graded 
edge rusher in football. When he was at his best in 2017, that one year that he was actually good, he was 18th. He's now 7th. There's no way they maintain this, ever. This is fluky. It has to do with something, with the competition they faced in the past. I don't know. But that's not going to stay that way. And so when that starts to back off, and, you know, again, if there's any reason for Brissett to kind of step up, I don't know. It just, I, I again, I'll, I'll take the Raiders. I like the Raiders. But it's a little too fluky for me. Las Vegas is too stupid prone. They make too many mistakes. Their defense has way too many holes. And I really think Jacoby Brissett is kind of a wild card. I mean, they were even talking about the fact that how the the Vegas line didn't move when Tua was supposed to be playing and how that really shows how bad Tua is when your backup comes in and they're like, nah, we'll we'll keep the line at what it's at. And so I do I do kind of wonder if Brissett comes in and brings a different kind of energy and motivation and he kind of plays hard and finds a way to win against a Raiders team that's prompt to uh, losing on occasion, especially coming off a 2-0 fluky start to the season. Uh, Tampa and LA, I'm confident Tampa's going to win just because I hate Tampa and that's just the way that that goes. I would love it if LA would win, but they've been kind of, they kind of remind me of, uh, who's the team we're playing tonight? <laughs> My brain is so fried. It's 9.30, I got to get out of here. The 49ers. They're 2-0. Everybody loves them. Everybody knows they've got talent, but their wins have not been all that convincing. Tampa has just, they look like they're ready to just play the Super Bowl tomorrow. Um, Maybe that's overstating it, but uh, Tampa's minus one and a half. I actually did put a little money on that. And by little, I mean a little. Most of that is just to hedge my emotions, because if I lose that bet, assuming Tampa doesn't win by like one point, which would suck, but assuming LA wins, I'll be fine with it. I'm fine losing like the $3 I put on that game. But I just, I just don't think so, man. I think Tampa just keeps rolling. Uh, Seattle, Minnesota, that one is a little bit... It kind of just comes down to Minnesota's mentality for me because they just seem so emotionally broken. And Seattle's just the opposite. They're, they're a team, every year I look at them, they're like, yeah, they got nothing left, man. There's nothing left in the tank, and they just keep winning. Minnesota's more like the Packers, where you look at the team and you're like, that's quite a roster you got there. But they can't do anything with it. They don't know what they're doing. Seattle's the other side of it. Seattle's just like uh, Kansas City, where... You look at the roster and go, you guys are trash, but they keep winning. But um, minus two for the Seattle Seahawks. Um, obviously, we want the Seahawks to win. That kind of goes without saying. Um, Dalvin Cook is probably playing injured in this game. Justin Jefferson is off to a slow start. Adam Thielen, all these guys are. Kirk Cousins is ranked fourth, by the way, so he seems to be doing not the worst. But Thielen is 56th. Jefferson is 36th. Osborne is 41st. So the wide receivers... Not exactly off to the hottest start. The offensive line, not very good outside of Ezra Cleveland at guard. Everybody else has been not great. But this is no longer the Legion of Boom either. So if they're going to get back on track, this might not be the worst thing in the world. The the, um, corners and whatnot, I mean, they still got Wagner, but otherwise there's not a lot going on here. The biggest issue is going to be, however, the trying to stop Russell Wilson. Um, the pass rush hasn't really been there for Minnesota quite yet. I mean, Daniil Hunter ranked 25th overall at off the edge. Breland is the dead is dead last at corner. He's ranked 100th out of 100 corners. He's just getting absolutely annihilated. DK Metcalf is not exactly off to the hottest start, but again, we're kind of just getting early, and I'm sure he'll pick it up a little bit. Tyler Lockett is ranked 11th. He's on fire. Um, Carson's a solid running back. Wilson is a very good uh, quarterback, obviously. I I don't know. Unless the Vikings just kind of wake up and snap out of it and every, everything just kind of clicks, I think, uh, you know, I just think the the Seahawks are, are going to take advantage of a team that's just not in it. It is in Minnesota, which makes it kind of iffy. Um, I'm not putting anything on this. It's pretty close to a coin flip, but I do think Seattle wins. Um, obviously we've got the Packers and the 49ers, San Francisco's minus three. Am I touching that? Absolutely not. I think if anything, depending on what you think, you should probably put some money on it. Obviously, if you think the Packers are going to win, go for it. But the, the, the line doesn't really change anything because you know, if the 49ers are going to win, they're going to win big because the Packers don't just lose, they lose real bad. So it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to put a little bit on the 49ers because it takes a little bit of the sting out of a loss, and if they win, I mean, is a win worth 10 bucks to you? <laughs> I, I don't know. I will say it would be nice if uh, Seattle and the Bears lose, because that'll kind of ease us into this game here. If Chicago does pull off a win, though, you got to understand, 
uh, with the regardless of what happens with any of the other teams, the Packers have to win to keep pace. Otherwise, the Bears are going to lead the NFC North with a 2-1 lead, which, again, doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. It's just one week, and that'll self-correct over time. But that would kind of little little cherry on top of the um, sardine cake or whatever. I don't know. I was trying to think of something gross without being crude. That's the best I can come up with. But anyways, I got to get out of here. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. Please remember to uh, subscribe to the Packernet Podcast YouTube channel. Hit the little bell notification so you don't miss it when I go live. Otherwise, go to the Packernet Podcast Facebook page because I'll also be streaming over there. I might start streaming on Twitch. I don't really see a need to because I don't think that's ever going to amount to anything that's mostly for gaming and it's kind of a weird system. But just for the simple fact that there might be a couple people there and maybe that's better for some people and they want to tune in there and they get the notifications. I don't know. I don't really care either way, but it's it's an option. I just have to click a little button and I'm streaming on Twitch. But um, planning on doing maybe during one of these games, definitely a pregame and probably a postgame. If we win, more likely to be a postgame. If we lose, maybe not so much, especially since I'm going to be very tired. But anyways, you guys have yourselves a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.